The FBI will be fine in the long run. This fever around Donald Trump and the MAGA world will eventually break, but it's become somehow a nutty article of faith that the FBI is out to get Republicans. If you'd asked people 20 years ago whether that would someday be the accusation, they'd say that's nuts. It's nuts, but it will pass. It will not pass. It is our future, and it's going to get much worse. Joining me now to talk about that and other things, big fan Anna Perez. She has a show called Wrong Think, which I love. I love that. I love that title, Wrong Think with Anna Perez. Anna, we're not putting the band back together. Trust in the FBI is not going to return because the FBI doesn't seem even that interested in earning back your trust or my trust. No, and in fact, Americans are very uh, keenly aware of that. In fact, 24% of Americans, a poll just came out, 24% want the FBI to be defunded. And a very large percentage uh, besides that want to see major reform happen for the FBI. So uh, this is big stuff we're talking about here. I mean, this is the first time I've, at least in my career, seen, and I'm young, but, you know, uh, that still means something. I don't think at any point uh, have people been this concerned about the FBI and the existence of a deep state on this level. I mean, it used to be conspiracy to bring up the deep state and talk about these three letter agencies the way that we talk about them. Uh, now it seems people like Alex Jones are being vindicated. Uh, Donald Trump is calling out the deep state. He talks about retribution. And that's really what these people are scared of. They know that if they have someone, either Donald Trump or someone like him in office, that it could very well mean the end of the FBI. It could mean the end of the deep state, and especially since uh, Republicans in the House seem to be pursuing this. Uh, people like Anna Paulina Luna already called for the impeachment of Joe Biden should these allegations against him be true uh, or be proven true. I mean, we all believe that's the case, given what we saw on the laptop that's already been released to the public. Um, but look, this is the first time I've seen people really up in arms about this. This is not conspiracy. Uh, and you see Americans being targeted like Tara Reid, she had to move to Russia because she was getting all of these threats and the FBI couldn't protect her. I mean, this is bogus. American, The American people can see that this is obviously a lie. We've been lied to for years. Do you think, well, this, is, this is my struggle. I, everyone has their own thing they struggle with. I believe we have to wake Normie Norm up. I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about your neighbor who agrees with you on everything but doesn't ever want to get involved. My neighbors are the same way. I don't I don't live around uh, political people. They're people who share my values, but they kind of laugh this stuff off or don't really care that much, and I'm always serving to shake them awake. Is this stuff waking them up? I'm not worried about people who watch wrong think. I'm worried about the people <laughs> who don't. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. This is a concern I think a lot of conservatives share. And I will tell you this, I think we've tapped into an anti-establishment wing of the left. And I know that sounds crazy, but we just saw Matt Gates and AOC team up for legislation that would fight insider trading, which as we all know, almost every member of Congress is involved in in some capacity, particularly uh, establishment, uh, both people, members of the establishment left and the establishment right. Uh, but I think there is an opportunity. You know, you look look at the you look at political theories. You look at the horseshoe theory. I think there is an opportunity to tap into that anti-establishment left that seems to have disappeared for so long. I know they were very prominent in the '60s, but uh, it, it, we do need to bring that back on the left. And I think if we can tap into that somehow and come together on the fact that and say, look, you know, I know that you may vehemently disagree with me on economics, say, but. I think we can both agree that moderates, that these quote moderates that are really just controlling the entirety of DC, the uniparty, they're the real problem here. They're the people who are controlling your lives on a daily basis and they control what your life, whether you be a leftist or you know a conservative. Reparations is one of those things that make everybody, almost universally, everyone rolls their eyes. Oh brother, here we go, reparations again, reparations again. But I don't think people understand how close we are to that becoming a reality, at least in blue states in this country. Here's a little video. All this nonsense, homelessness, and all this other garbage y'all talk about, police violence and all this stuff, don't nobody care about that. Don't nobody real care about that. We care about our reparations. And we have to put white people on notice that we want our reparations. We want our reparations, $3 million per person. Is this something that's going to happen, Anna? 
it already has happened in a lot of states and a lot of counties across the country. And it just seems like something that these uh, white liberals, the savior complex they have that they're voting for. Uh, but look, we're constantly told we have to be ashamed of our history. We have to be ashamed of our past. Kids are lied to from a very young age about the United States of America and how, quote, racist we are. So if we really want to fix this problem as conservatives, if we really want a solution, we're going to have to start changing the messaging, uh, which will be difficult to do. But again, it's all part of what we need to do to reform the education system that is so, so poorly put together. I mean, most teachers are... Uh, you know, a lot of fat, blue-haired, leftist socialists. Now, there are great teachers out there, don't get me wrong, okay? But a lot of them don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I remember uh, Gavin McInnes told me the story one time. His kid came home from school, and the, the teacher literally misspelled your. It was She spelled it Y-O-U-R instead of the apostrophe R-E, you're a star. And he was like, I, I can't take this anymore. These people are not smart. And they're not smart because they're born out of the same system. They're a product of the same system that tells you that the 1619 project is true, which obviously is not the case. It's all a lie. Uh, so we do need to fix this because it is actually wreaking havoc on this country already. She is the host of Wrong Think, highly recommended. And I come back soon. That was awesome. Thanks, Jesse. I appreciate you having me. You bet. Don't think we're done. We have, we have so much more. You want to talk about world famous authors? Stop. I'm actually not talking about me. Let's discuss some things a little deeper. How do we fight back? What are the practical ways we can fight back? We'll talk about that in just a moment. First of all, let's talk about you fighting back against your timeshare company. The one that's holding you hostage. Like they have a gun to your head. You want out of your timeshare. You do, and I don't blame you. Eventually, they get old, right? Eventually, you don't use them anymore. You want out. You don't want to pay annual fees. You don't want to pay special assessments. You want out, and you call them, hey, uh, can I get out? I think I'm done with it. And they say, nope, sorry, you signed on the dotted line. Should have read the fine print. Lone Star Transfer will get you out. Don't believe these timeshare companies. They're scammers. They're liars. Lone Star Transfer has helped over 18,000 people get out. We're talking about a family company that's successful 99% of the time. They guarantee it. They put it in writing. They give you a time frame they'll get you out. Call them. You're one phone call away from freedom, from being done with that timeshare. 844-310-2646. All right? 844-310-2646. Or go to LoneStarTransfer.com. We'll be back. One of the greatest things about being a world-renowned, world-famous author now is I'm in this special club with other world-famous authors. So it's just like me, you know, like Ernest Hemingway or Shakespeare, and I'm in this club with other people who are really important like that who write books. And one of those people is joining me now. Her name's Peachy Keenan. She has actually a really cool book out called Domestic Extremist about taking these people on. She also writes for maybe my favorite favorite publication, The Federalist. Peachy, what is it like being world famous and super important <laughs> and smarter than everyone else now? I know I personally am enjoying it. Yeah, I was hoping you could give me some advice how to deal with my newfound fame as a, as a famous author for 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it's really well, funny. The, the key... The key, Peachy, is to rub it in everyone's face and hold it over family and <laughs> friends and things like that. That's what I've been doing for 24 hours. And everyone's really cut me off, but I think it's out of admiration more than anything else. Yeah, and congratulations on the book, by the way. I um, I know it's a friendly competition between us, launching yesterday and the same day. Um, your book is looks awesome. I can't wait to read it. But I figure now that I'm famous, I can walk into any restaurant, get a VIP table, order off the menu. You know, I have I have I have rights now as a celebrity. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you yeah. do. I just sign random autographs for people who don't even ask for it. All right, Peachy, let's let's do focus on this. Uh, an extremist. That word is thrown around a lot mm -hmm. now. I'm sure that's one of the reasons that prompted you to write a book, because it is a lot of work writing one. Why did you write it? What What are you talking about? 
Yeah, I mean, the title is obviously ironic. Um, you know, normal people like me and you who just want to live our lives are no longer allowed to. Uh, we are we can't opt out of the craziness. And if you do try to opt out, you are called an extremist. You're called a literal domestic terrorist. So that's what the title means. But what I'm suggesting to people in the book is that the best way to fight back and win the culture war is to actually become an extremist in your own way. And I mean, extremely domestic, you know, center yourself around uh, finding a spouse, getting married, creating your own, creating a beautiful family, having, you know, maybe one or two extra kids, don't stop at one or two, and then protect those children and keep them, you know, insulated from the madness. And that is what it means to be a domestic extremist. And I am P.G. Keenan, and I am a domestic extremist. I have actually read your book. You sent it to me a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and it's outstanding, and you're 100% right. Thank but, Peachy, I don't understand. What are you talking about? How would, how would getting married or, or starting a family, how would this stop all this nonsense we see? I thought it was all about voting and the pools and legislation and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of people have sort of lost faith that one election can kind of fix what's gone wrong in America. That, you know, we're just we're just one vote away. We're just one, you know, right good candidate away from making everything go back to how it was like within recent memory. You know, we've lost so much just in a few years. We all grew up in an America that is really no longer recognizable. And I am trying to figure out and scramble around like how how do I raise kids in this environment? How how do I protect them? And so I think the answer is really not to rely on politicians, on politics, or even on laws. I mean, those those are helpful. I, you know, I prefer a different president to Joe Biden, but that's not really going to be the long-term answer. And the long-term answer has to come from within each of us. It has to come um, culturally and socially. And that's why we have to go back to these sort of basic eternal timeless truths that like the family is very is the most powerful political unit in the world really. And that's why we're under threat. They don't they don't really want us forming families because the, the tighter knit your family, um, the harder time they have to access your children's minds. In every country where communism has taken hold, they've tried to shatter the family, mm -hmm. everyone. So in case you doubt yes. her, just know that they go after the family first. Strong family units are not susceptible to communism. Weak ones are. But Peachy, okay, so you talk about parenting. I've got two boys, 12 and 14, rotten little oh scoundrels they are, <laughs> but I love them, and I don't want them to be, look, I'm not worried about them growing up to be commies, I don't want them to be destroyed by this world, though. I want to prepare them mm -hmm. to go into this world. What do you tell someone like me, and look, we have a lot of families who watch the show, families watch, but parents watch with their kids. What do you tell them? Yeah, it's really, it's really hard. It's a perilous time um, to be a parent. I have teenage boys and um, young Let's daughters, and <laughs> there's a lot going on. And I mean, my main tip I tell people is, you know, to paraphrase Sartre, uh, hell is other people's children. So, I mean, you can be doing, you know, a perfect job of teaching your kids the right values, how, what not to do, you know, for boys, you know, don't download pornography. Um, you know how to treat how to treat girls, how to keep your gender. Um, <laughs> you know, not put on the dress that they might the teachers telling you to put on. But um, the other it's the other kids that you have to worry about, and that comes down to what school your kids are in. Like you can do all have all the rules you want, but the the eight year old in the kids class in your kids class or at the park, he's going to be showing them pornography. And this happened to me. My, that's how my kids, you know, saw. Pornography for the first time. It was another child hold on, that I didn't on, know. Hold on, Peachy, I'm sorry. I'm, Peachy, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you say eight years old? Eight. That's the average age that young boys are seeing pornography. It's what? literally eight years, yes, on their phones. And so don't give your child a phone and really vet who your child is hanging out with. Like, make sure you know the people. And that might require a new school. And I think that in many cases, you know, that is going to be your 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 best bet. Yeah, terrifying, right? Eight years yeah. old. Oh right. my gosh! I'm gonna I'm going home right now. I might I might just take the microphone <laughs> off right now to just lock my kids inside of the home. Eight years old. Oh my oh, gosh! Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. You wrote a great piece, uh, not for the Federalist, for the American Mind, called "The War Against the Normies," talking about normies getting stomped out. I talk about normies all the time on my show. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah, look, I mean, I come from a long line of normies. Um, you know, I was a normie for most of my life before the left radicalized me 
into becoming a domestic extremist, you know? Um, normies are going to save the country. And my book, and I'm sure your book too, is 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 to help the normies, the, the, no, the normal people who just wanna be left alone, they just wanna opt out, kind of help them wake up to what is going on and, and realize what time it is. And the good news is that people are waking up. Um, we're seeing just this month, you know, happy pride, everyone. Um, regular people who are really normally apolitical, who don't care about this stuff, are suddenly taking a stand. And like, I have friends who are totally apolitical, you know, they don't really follow the things, they're not super online like me, but they're now cheering like the stock price of Target going down. And they're excited about Bud Light's um, sales going down. They're having fun now, seeing that these cultural powers um, are hurt by their bad like woke policies. And so the normies are waking up and I think that we need to just kind of keep growing our, our normie army to win the culture war. I 100% agree with you and I've argued mm -hmm. that the whole tranny stuff, specifically the tranny <laughs> stuff aimed at kids, that that yeah. was the stuff that snapped normie norm awake. That he could have ignored most stuff but you wake up one day and they're chopping off the boys of 12 year old, they're chopping off penises of 12 year old boys and you realize, wow, I'm dealing with demons here. Her name is Peachy Keenan. Her book is called Domestic Extremist. I have read it. I endorse it completely. It is freaking awesome. Go get it oh, and, I, and support her in any you. way you can. Peachy, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Jesse. Good luck with the book. Appreciate you. All right, birth rates. That's an uncomfortable conversation, isn't it? It's kind of icky. Almost a little bit personal. Birth rates? Yeah. You want to get icky? Wait, no. It'll be clean. But you want to talk about it? Let's talk about it next. Before we talk about that, birth rates. Why is it a crisis? Why are they down? There are many, many, many reasons. Some outside of our control. Some within our control. But testosterone levels free falling, it's an undeniable, undeniable factor in it, and a huge factor. If you have a society full of low T men, you're not in a society where men desire to procreate with women. It's just a fact. And if you don't procreate with women, you don't get to have a society anymore. It's how God made us. It's important. So what do we do? With testosterone levels and free fall, what do we do? We have to fight back. Chalk is the way we fight back. It might be how we save this place. We have to be a bunch of high T people in this country. Male vitality stack from chalk. Go get on one and stay on one. Stay on it for 90 days. You give me 90 days. If you don't feel, it's palpable. If you don't feel different, cancel it. I want you to cancel your subscription. Female vitality stack for the ladies. It's important. Believe me, whether you're 20, and getting ready to start procreating or 90 and you're all done. It's important for your focus, for your energy, for how you feel. CHOQ.com, all natural herbal supplements. Chalk.com, promo code JESSE is how you get 35% off subscriptions. Go get one, all right? We'll be back. focus on securing our border, combating the climate crisis, and protecting the fundamental rights of Americans. That's great news. We're fighting the climate crisis, which apparently there is one. I, I haven't noticed, but there's a climate crisis. We're definitely tackling it and securing the border. I guess all is well. Joining me now, Todd Bensman. He is the fellow at the Center for Immigration Studies. I love them, by the way. And he's also the author of the book, Overrun talking about the border. If you want to know what's actually happening at your southern border, which it's pretty horrifying to read, but I'm glad I read it. Todd, okay, let's talk about this for a moment. How overrun is the border? Because people will see TV and they see little social media clips, but they don't understand what's actually happening on the ground because most people ain't down there. Well, in broad strokes, for two and a half years, we have hit uh, a, a major, uh, smashed a major record of one sort or another, month after month after month, year after year. We're now into the third year. Uh, we have never seen numbers this vast, not even close to this vast. Uh, you know, 2.4 million apprehensions last year. We're headed to 3 million encounters this year, uh, 1.7 million the first year. 
It's just millions and millions of people uh, attempting to cross that border or or crossing that border. And the main reason is that we have uh, pursued policies that let them in. Uh, I'll just repeat that, let them in. When you let them in, uh, they send selfies home to the home villages or you know, to relatives and people who are still on the way in, uh, showing that they are in. And therefore, you should come in too in the same way and here's how to do it. And uh, because of that, we have had this just utter uh, you know, human avalanche of, of, a, of, a, of a torrent of uh, people coming through that border. And uh, absolutely, this is a historic event in American history. Okay, first of all, I want to focus on something because you know a lot about this stuff and we do not. Where are they coming from? Most Americans naturally, understandably, think, well, they're all coming from Mexico. That's obviously not the case. That's not even half the case anymore. But they don't understand where. Where are these people coming from? Well, they're coming from uh, 160 countries from around the world that are not (laughs) Mexico. Or, or Central America. They are coming from the entire globe has heard about the open uh, gate and they are coming for it. Um, I've met probably uh, immigrants from every single country on the continent of Africa. I can't think of one uh, that I haven't met somebody from. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I met my very first Dagestanis uh, from Dagestan. Um, I met in, in my hotel in Matamoros uh, was absolutely filled with uh, Kyrgyzstanis, Kyrgs. They called themselves Kyrgs, uh, coming from Belarus, uh, Russia, every country of the Middle East. Uh, really, there's nowhere in the world that they're not coming from. Uh, I, you know, uh, the 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 issue here is that probably forty five percent of everyone who is reaching the border is not from your grandparents' border crisis of Mexicans and Central Americans, although plenty are. Uh, They're coming from uh, dangerous places with terrorist organizations, uh, lots coming from China right now, thousands, 10,000 coming from China just since October. Uh, So that's what we're facing. Okay, and I know that I'm about to ask you the broadest, lamest question in the world, so take as much time as you need, but I really want to know, why are they coming? I know that's a complicated answer that will differ because there's so many people coming, but why? I mean, actually, it's not that complicated uh, because, remember, I spend uh, a lot of my time with the immigrants uh, on the trail. I've interviewed thousands of them about this, Um, Most of them are coming from countries that are just no good. I mean, nobody wants to live in Haiti. Uh, It's not necessarily political persecution, but there might be uh, a chance to improve your lot in life if you can get over the U.S. border. Um, So that's just a steady state. Nothing changed changed there. That's the way it has always been uh, for decades and decades. This country is better than other countries. That's just the way it is. What changes, what creates ebbs and flows and uh, sudden spikes and decreases is American policy. That's the door, that's the hinge, that's the, the, the uh, spigot. And what the administration did, the Biden administration did when they first got into office is uh, they opened the spigots wide. They said, we're going to take all families, any family that crosses, they get in, we're going to get them in. All uh, unaccompanied minors, if you cross without a parent, you're gonna get in. All pregnant women, six months or or more, you're gonna get in. And then in the meantime, uh, we'll be so busy processing your papers into the country of millions of those people that we're gonna leave the border undefended and unguarded. And so a million seven have crossed in, just running in uh, into the interior. So all together, Right. I mean, it's just a complete chaotic situation down there that is entirely due to policy decisions that the immigrants are paying very, very close attention to. They're very smart, very rational. Uh, They're not going to lay down 
5,000 or $10,000 in smuggling fees unless they have a really good uh, assurance that they're going to get in and stay in. Otherwise, you're not spending that kind of money. I wouldn't, you wouldn't, nobody would, and neither would they. So it's all about weighing the odds that you're gonna get in. And most of them are guaranteed entry under this administration. So they're laying that smuggling money down and they're coming. Okay, where are they going once they're here? And what do they do? How do you find a job? Are there, do they find a job? Where are they going and what are they doing? It depends. Well, first of all, to the question of where they're going, I always ask them, where are you going? So I know uh, they're going to every city in America, large, small, uh, in the interior, in the heartland, on the on the uh, both coasts, from Seattle down to San Diego, from Maine all the way down to Miami, uh, and everywhere in between. Uh, really just hundreds upon hundreds of thousands and now millions of people have just flooded in. And they get on, when they cross the border, uh, the administration gives them a quick release papers. Uh, and within 24, 48 hours, they're on a bus to wherever they wanna go uh, with a pinky finger agreement that they will turn themselves in voluntarily to an ICE office at some point and figure it out later. Uh, but in the meantime, some of them have uh, are given work authorizations. Uh, a lot of them are being given work authorizations if they come in in a certain way. Uh, and the rest can just work illegally or qualify for local uh, uh, welfare. You know, cities, all the cities provide, you know, welfare and housing subsidies and food and clothing and volunteer. And, you know, New York's got them all in, you know, gigantic hotels that are completely filled with immigrants. Everything's paid, food, clothing, everything. School is, of course, public schools are free. So they're just flooding into all of our public schools, which by the way, are having to buy uh, portable classrooms. If I, mean, I tell you, if there's a uh, publicly traded portable classroom manufacturer, I'm buying that stock. Uh, but, uh, you know, lots of school districts are having to have bond elections to spike the tax rate to pay for all this these uh, new influxes. None of them are insured. Uh, so they're all going on. Um, I mean, millions of, of people are going on to uh, public, um, you know, Medicaid and local state insurance plans, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, the book is overrun. If you want to know what's actually going on down there, Todd, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the uh, attention to the problem. You bet. All right. We have a very special, very famous light in the mood coming next. Before we get to that, Father's Day's coming. You know it's coming, right? Have you made any preparations? Probably not. You know why? Because dads are impossible to buy for. My dad, I don't think he's ever cared about a single Father's Day gift I've ever bought him. I'll get him, a, a, you know, golf balls here or a new book there, although I know which book I'm getting him this year. But he never cares. You know why? Because I haven't gotten dad gadgets. Your dad wants things that are useful and cool. Your dad wants a new wallet, even if he doesn't know it. His wallet sucks. Grip6 wallets are the best. Your cards lock into these wallets. You can get them with or without the loop on them, but your cards lock in. When you want them, you just squeeze it. They come popping right out. Isn't that friggin' cool? It's simple, and it's awesome. Made in America. Grip6 has the best socks. They have the best belts. They have the coolest wallets around. And right now, 25% off site-wide. But wait, there's actually something even better than that. By the way, Dad can twirl his wallet and his fingers like I do right now, feeling like you're in the Old West. There's one more thing. They have Dad Packs at Grip6, 40% off. You have to go to grip6.com slash jesse. Get dad a dad pack. Save a fortune. Grip6.com slash jesse. We'll be back. All right. We're going to do a very special light in the mood tonight. I don't want to call it sacred because that's a little too far, but something you'll probably remember the rest of your life. I wanted to read just a little blurb from chapter two of my book, The Anti-Communist Manifesto. And keep in mind, remember this. If you want to buy the book, if you want to buy a signed book, if you want info on the book tour and they have tickets for the book tour stops there and all the info you need, 
Everything you need is at jessekellybook.com. That's one, two. I cannot believe you guys. The book, the book is not supposed to be in the top 100 of books sold in America with all the kids' books and fiction books. Uh, this thing might go to number one. You guys are insane. Anyway, chapter two, here it is. As a result of persecution, conservative academics are a dying breed. A survey by Econ Journal Watch in September 2016 that investigated the voter registration of 7,243 professors at 40 leading U.S. universities found that Democrats outnumber Republicans by an average of 11.5 to 1. The picture looks even more grim when broken down into fields of study. Republicans are most represented in the field of economics, where they're only outnumbered 4.5 to 1. In law, Democrats outnumber Republicans 8 to 1. In psychology, 17.4 to 1. In journalism slash communication, 20 to 1. In history, 35 to 1. We are not merely surrounded, we are enveloped. We are the thong on Lizzo's body. Sorry about that little tidbit at the end. I, I can't help myself when I'm writing stuff. Anyway jessekellybook.com. See you tomorrow.